Hi everyone, it's Dawn. Welcome back to my channel. So it's a really gloomy day today and I wanted to film a video for you, but um, when it's gloomy, I don't really want to do like any makeup tutorials or, you know, things like that. I just thought I would do a chat today. And this is a chat that has been requested because about a year ago or two years ago, maybe I did a similar video and I get a lot of questions on that video. So I thought I would just do an update and I will just be chatting with you. I've got my cup of coffee and this is my favorite coffee mug. My husband got this for me from Starbucks in 1993 um, for Easter and I still have it. I love this mug. It's so big. It can hold like three cups of coffee in it. It's like a monster cup, but I love it and I cherish this cup. So I've got my favorite coffee cup and this is just going to be a chat and it's going to be about menopause. And I know menopause is incredibly personal, highly individualistic or individual, individual, whatever the word would be. And no two people go through it the same. My mom and I didn't even go through it the same, although it does seem to be very ge highly genetic as well. So if you look at your mom, your aunts on your mother's side and your sister's typically you'll follow the same trajectory, but not always. So um, I am a registered nurse, but I am not a professional on menopause at all. I was an ICU nurse and my specialty was cardiovascular and open heart surgery and things like that. So definitely not menopause. So I will lead you to someone who I found incredibly helpful, and it is Menopause Taylor. She has a YouTube channel. She's an OBGYN who specializes in menopause, and she does um, a series on her channel. You could even purchase a workbook and follow along, and all of her videos go in order. You could watch them in order and fill out the workbook and take control of your menopause. And I actually did that. I didn't purchase the workbook, but I had a notebook and I kind of followed along for a very long time until I kind of got through, I'm not through menopause yet, and I'll explain that, but I followed along um, during the time when I was not sure what my body was telling me or I had a lot of questions and it was really helpful in that I could take those questions and the information about my own body that I wrote down to my OBGYN and be a partner with him about my menopause rather than, um, you know, having the doctor tell me what I need to do. Instead, I could go in and say, well, I'm thinking this, this, and this, and um, based on this, you know what I mean? So I had more knowledge and anybody can have that knowledge. So um, I would really recommend her channel and you don't have to follow along. You could even just pick and choose videos that are of interest to you. After I stopped following along, I did start picking and choosing videos that answered questions that I had. And if I couldn't find a particular video, I would just send her a message and she would respond so quickly and lead me to the correct video that would be helpful to me. So um, she's a valuable resource and I'll link her channel below. So um, anyways, I started going through perimenopause. I guess we're always perimenopause when we're around the time of menopause. So when your body starts, you're getting through your childbearing years and your body's starting to go through the change, you are now in perimenopause. And I had babies all the way up until I was 37 years old. I had five pregnancies, four live births, and um, I nursed for about a year or longer afterward. So by the time I was finished, I was nearing 40. So I only had a few years of sort of getting into a cycle again before my body started acting wonky, which was around 45 or 46, where I noticed that my periods were getting very, very heavy. They were pretty regular still, but just very, very heavy. And I remembered that when my mom went through menopause, she, I have like a little itchy eye, sorry about that. It's like I'm trying not to itch it and it's just getting worse. Um, anyways, my mom started to go through menopause. Well, when she started going through menopause, she started bleeding very, very heavy. And not to get off topic, but to tell you what happened to her was that between her late 40s and early 50s, her periods got incredibly heavy and she had to wear like these um, huge pads and it was miserable for her. And she went to her doctor 
finally and was really complaining about it and they said that she should have a dnc because i guess she had a buildup in her endometrial lining and it was causing this really you know she it was hormonally related and it was related to menopause um, this was back in the early, late 80s, early 90s. So she did go and have a DNC and then she never had a period after that. After that day that she finished, had the DNC, she never even had like spotting or a period. So she was in menopause, she was post-menopausal then. So like after a year, you know, you have to go an entire year without a period. If you go 11 and a half months and have a period, you're not menopausal yet. It has to be an entire year. And if you go 11 and a half months, and then you have a period you have to start over counting from month one again and it's it can be frustrating for those of us who just kind of want to be through it so she did she went through menopause so when I hit my late four mid to late 40s and started getting heavier and heavier periods I thought for sure that's what's gonna happen I'm just gonna get heavier and heavier possibly need a DNC and then I'll be through menopause because that's what happened to my mother um but what actually ended up happening was I got heavier periods and then they got further and further apart. And when I would have one, it would be, they're very willy nilly. They'd be heavy or they'd be light or I'd skip a few months. And it was nothing like what my mom went through. I even asked her about it and she's like, nope, that wasn't my experience. I do have a sister who's two years older than me and she followed the same trajectory as my mother. Um, I don't think she had a DNC though. She just kind of got heavier and heavier and heavier and then they eventually just stopped. So hers was very similar. I was different, but I've always been a little bit different genetically from my mom and my sister. Like they're very petite. They're like 5'2 and these tiny ladies and I'm 5'8 and they're blonde and I have red hair and their skin tans and mine doesn't. So I don't know, I'm just very different genetically. So around the time that I was having these wonky periods, I was also experiencing some unpleasant symptoms. I was having irritability, um, some sleeplessness, either trouble falling asleep or night waking and being unable to get back to sleep or just waking up at an ungodly hour in the morning and not being able to go back to sleep. And it was really creating um, a brain fog and some real irritability. I also noticed that where I would normally put on weight when I would overdo it would be like my my rear end and my thighs. And now I was noticing that I was starting to put on weight like in my tummy for the first time ever. And um, so I was not enjoying that obviously, but, um, and I was noticing that I could not, I wouldn't have to eat as much to put on weight. So things were just slowing down. That's what was happening. Um, so I did go see my OBGYN for my annual visit and I mentioned all these symptoms and I noticed and my family had been complaining about the irritability, obviously. My husband didn't like the night waking, you know, I'd wake him up too and he felt bad for me because he knows how much I love to sleep. So I did go to the doctor and he ran some tests. He drew some blood work and just checked all my blood work and everything was fine. And then he did a hormonal panel and I had to go back and a few months to compare it. So what they did is they checked my FSH. Um, they check a couple of hormone stimulating hormones, your follicle stimulating hormone, FSH, and your luteinizing hormone. And then they check your estrogen and your progesterone. So the two that we were really focusing on was my follicle stimulating hormone, which is the hormone that makes you ovulate or tells your body to ovulate, and your estrogen. So when I had my blood drawn initially, the first, the first panel of tests, my estrogen was very, very high, which indicated that I could have been heading into menopause and he needed to compare it to my tests in the near future. So I went back in a few months and got some more blood work and we compared that to the first blood panel. And so the second blood panel showed that my follicle stimulating hormone, which is the hormone that is in your ovaries and it tells your brain, ovulate, you know, so it's, it, your FSH says ovulate, and then your brain, the estrogen in your brain is like, no. And then your FSH says ovulate, and your brain says no. And so it keeps on getting louder and louder. So as it's doing that, your FSH is getting higher and higher and higher, and then your estrogen is getting lower and lower and lower. So that's what mine showed when we compared it. So the first blood panel, the estrogen was high, and we needed to see what was happening in the future. So I can't remember 
it was around five or six months that I went back later and then it showed that my FSH was high and my estrogen was low. So it showed that I was heading into menopause. It was just a comfort blood confirmation. Not everyone needs to have that done, but because we were going to treat the symptoms, it was wise to have the blood work done. And so then at that time he prescribed um, Clamera Pro patches for me, which I'd already heard about on Menopause Taylor, along with lots of other options, lots of other types of hormone replacement therapy, and even some natural approaches to hormone replacement therapy. But I thought, that's fine, I'll go ahead and take these patches. So he gave me Clamera Pro, and it's estrogen and progesterone in a patch, and you put it somewhere on your body where you have a lot of more fat, and you don't have, um, not on your breasts or by your ovaries. So I would put those patches on once a week and um, change it weekly. And I started to feel like myself again. I started to just feel just like myself before my hormones started going crazy. And I was overjoyed with it. However, there were some downsides to that. The patch would sometimes come off in the shower and they were $50 a piece, like $200 for a pack and my insurance didn't cover it. So every month I was paying $200 out of pocket for these patches. And so we decided then after a few months on that, that I would try to go on a low dose birth control pill um, that will over, so what the patch did is it replaced my hormones that I was missing. The low dose birth control pill overrides your hormones and gives you the hormones back. So I decided to go on low seasonique, which is seasonique birth control, which the normal birth control seasonique you take for three months and then you take a week off and you menstruate and then go on for another three months, take a week off and menstruate. So you menstruate just once every three months. Low seasonique is the same way, except you might not menstruate. So low seasonique is a much lower dose and it overrides your hormones and gives you the hormones. So some people asked me questions about that. They asked me in my old video, am I still taking the patch or am I take, what am I doing now? And I would explain, I'm taking the slow dose birth control pill and then they would say well how do you know you're in menopause well if you're taking a low dose birth control pill and you're in menopause or heading into menopause you won't know because you're replacing you're not just replacing the hormones you're overriding them so if you're on birth control pills and going through menopause you shouldn't really know not that that's a bad thing but it, I don't know, it's probably a good idea to stop taking them and see what your body, where your body's at. It's just my personal opinion, but that's just my opinion. And what's that worth? Everyone's got an opinion, right? So um, for me, that has been wonderful. I take this low dose birth control pill every single night, a week off every three months, sometimes, well, and here's why I decided to make this video. I was at almost a complete year with no cycle. Even though it's overriding, it's a low dose, but I should be getting my period once every three months and I hadn't been, and I just got a period. I knew when we were on spring break, my breasts were really tender and I thought something's up and then sure enough, I got my period. And it's weird, I'm just about to take that week off, so it's right before I'm about to take the week off of my pill. But I will, so I'm not through menopause yet, but I am so, so close. But I have to start counting now from month one all the way to month 12, right? To know that I'm completely menopausal. And it's funny because I'm, I feel like a high schooler again. Like, you know, I, I don't have my own pads or Tampax or anything in the house for me anymore. You know, my daughters took all that when they're at college. I don't, I haven't needed it. So I have like toilet paper folded up. You know what I mean? I've got to go to the store and get the stuff. So you've got to kind of be thinking you might get your period at any time. So it's good and it's bad. Like my daughters will say, don't you miss it? Don't you? I'm like, no, I am overjoyed to not get my period anymore. To not have to worry about that. I'm really happy about that. But I know that some women really grieve that. You know, I remember one time when I was like in my late 30s, I went to the dentist to get a dental cleaning and she was asking me all these questions about dry mouth. I don't have dry mouth, but she was asking me questions
questions about it. And then I asked her why. She said, well, because you're getting close to the age. And a lot of times women going through menopause can get more cavities because everything gets drier. Your mouth gets drier. Everything gets drier. And it can cause more cavities. So she was just doing some preventive question asking. And I remember thinking to myself, you got it all wrong. I am fertile and I am still having my period. And I, you know, I was like insulted. So at that time, I was not ready. <laughs> I was not ready. But when you get to be my age, you do start to feel ready, I think. Um, I have my babies. I, you know, I did kind of go through a period of time where I thought I can never have another baby. I could never... I mean, not that I want another baby, but I, I liked knowing that I could have another one, but I can't. And th that ship has sailed for me and I've now embraced it and I'm okay with it. I'm fine with it. And I look forward to having grandchildren one day, but that does kind of mess with your brain because you go through so many years, first of all, trying to prevent pregnancy if you don't want babies right away and then having your babies. And for me, I had five pregnancies and four live births. So my thirties just consisted of pregnancy and nursing and birthing babies. And it was such a joyful time of my life, you know? And then I had my forties where I was raising my little ones up to being grown ups, and now my youngest is 15. So life is full of seasons and I'm embracing this next season because what am I gonna do, right? You can't, you can't fight it, you just have to ride it out and go through it. But um, I do, so there are many reasons why I'm taking the birth control, I mean the low dose birth control as hormone replacement. It works for me, I have my annual exams and I'm fine. I don't have a family history of breast cancer. So, um, you know, we do have to watch for that because estrogen does make things grow. That's what it does. So it keeps things lubricated. It helps things grow. So if you are, you know, someone who's at risk for breast cancer or certain types of cancers, hormone replacement therapy won't be for you. But hormone replacement therapy also prevents other types of cancer and it helps you with osteoporosis. So there's good and bad on both sides and you just have to weigh the risk to the benefit for your own personal um, genetics and who you are. And so that's what I do and I'm partnered with my doctor. I watch the symptoms I'm having and you know it's all been good. Now there is something else that's worth mentioning and it's not worth going on hormone replacement therapy for if you are at risk because nothing is worth risking your health or your life. But being on a hormone replacement therapy does help with your skin. It keeps your skin supple and um, you continue to build that collagen and elastin like you would when you had those hormones. And when you take those hormones away, namely estrogen, you, you everything slows down. Your collagen, your el elastin, and everything slows down and you might start to see your skin aging more, getting much drier, maybe, um, you know, a little more sagging but we live in the best time ever for that because there are so many things that you can purchase over the counter, topical products to combat that and you can still fight it just with other tools. So I wanted to mention that and also your figure. You're gonna, um, well, your figure, you're not going to put on that weight in the middle like you typically do when you're postmenopausal. You know how once we go through menopause, our body, we start to put on a little more weight in our arms and in our middle and um, our, our physique changes. So when you're on hormone replacement, you might not see those signs as much. But again, you can combat that with diet and exercise. So there are other tools that you can fight it with. It's, you're not doomed. And I just want to say that because, and I want to say it because I am on hormone replacement. So I don't want those of you who are my age who aren't taking it and thinking, well, I should have better skin or I should, I, I, it's an advantage. It really is, but you can do other things. And um, I think menopause Barbie does cover that as well. Other things that you can do. Um, so it's really important for you to know that, that you're not doomed. You're not going to go to hell in a handbasket because you can't take hormone replacement therapy. So um, the other thing is your libido, <laughs> your libido. Um, I lost my sex drive when I was first going through menopause. 
um, and wasn't on hormone replacement. And that was another thing that I did not like and my husband did not like. And once I went on hormone replacement, that resolved. Um, so, you know, there are things that are worth addressing. If it's really making your life miserable, you're noticing that your libido is really low, you might be putting on weight in all the wrong places, you might be, um, your skin is changing and you don't know how to address these new changes, you're grouchy, irritable, and not sleeping well. Those were all my symptoms. Oh, and I also, at that time, way back, I went on a low dose of an antidepressant as well. And I know some people would be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe Dawn's sharing that on her YouTube channel, like neighbors and friends and family and so on. But I think it's really important for you to know because I'm a nurse, I'm a woman, I'm going through menopause, I'm a mother, I'm a wife, and there's no shame, absolutely no shame. If you need to go to the doctor and get on something for um, depression, then by all means, if it's going to save you and help you enjoy your life, do it. I do have an opinion, and I think it's supported in the medical literature and community, so I am going to share this opinion. <sighs> Doctors who prescribe antidepressants don't take Xanax or benzodiazepines, if at all able to avoid them. My nursing opinion is that those are for emergencies. Your husband died, your mother died, and you are falling apart for a few days, and you need to get through those few days. A few pills might help that. Your house burnt down and you lost everything you have. So you get my drift. Extreme emergencies, because they are addictive and they are the dickens to get off of. If you get addicted and you try to get off benzodiazepines, it can be horrid. I've seen it. I've seen a lot of it when I was a nurse and I've read a lot about it. You might have might follow Jordan Peterson. He's a psychologist in Canada, um, a brilliant man, very right wing though. So he might not be for everyone, but he's, he, but he might be for everyone. There is a lot that he says that makes sense to a lot of people. And he recently shared his story, getting addicted and unaddicted to benzodiazepines. His wife got critically ill with cancer, his very best friend for his entire life. And he took them and got addicted and nearly died getting off of them. So please, please, please proceed with caution. If your doctor prescribes them, I'd even question why. Like, like I had a doctor once offer them to me when I had some postpartum depression. And I even said that, no, I need to feel these feelings. I need something to help me with the depression, but I need to get through this. I don't need to mask it or take something addictive, which is going to create a bigger problem. Um, your, um, your serotonin uptake inhibitors, SSRIs, those are good. Um, again, I'm not telling you to take them, but they're not addictive. Um, you know, those kinds of things that just help you balance your the chemicals in your brain without getting you addicted. I am very feel very strongly about that, so I wanted to share that. And if you are someone who does take benzodiazepines and you are addicted, try to meet with a doctor who can help you taper off of them and replace them with something else because... I know this isn't menopause related, and so I just, but I, I feel very passionately about that, and I wanted to share that with you. Um, so I do take, even to this day, I went off. What do I take now? I'll tell you what I take now. Hang on. So when I was first going, whoops, when I was first going through menopause, my doctor prescribed citralopram, 40 milligrams, one pill daily. And it really helped. After three months, my moods really started to change. I started to feel like my old self again. And then I tapered off of it completely. You also have to taper off um, just so you don't get like, it's not addictive like 
benzodiazepines are, but you do have to taper off of them. You can't stop them cold turkey or you get like this, this really weird feeling, like these things called like brain zaps and you don't want that. They're not pleasant. So I tapered off and then I was off for years, for like four years. And then I recently, not too long ago, started to not feel like myself again, starting to feel impatient, grouchy, the same kinds of feelings that I knew were helped when I went on the citraloprem before. So I restarted citraloprem 20 milligrams so the half the dose and I feel so much better I don't want to stay on it and in, like indefinitely but I think it really does help in these times and I think a big um, problem that made me need it again was quarantining isolating at home um, the whole virus and everything changing and then it was winter here in the Midwest and it was so cold this year that it really kind of I started to notice those feelings of feeling blue again so I decided to go on it again and it really helped it helped within a month and now it's spring and I'm starting to feel better again. I'm starting to feel really happy. So I think I can taper off again. So that's it. I don't think there's anything else that I need to share. I might've forgotten a few things. I'm still taking the low, the, the low season ink. I'm about to finish this three month pack and I've got my cycle. So I'm not postmenopausal. Dang it, I wish I was. So we're counting again from month one and I'm gonna pick up my prescription and continue it. I'm gonna continue to go for my annual visits to make sure I'm in good health and I get my blood work checked. I try to eat a really healthy diet. I try to eat a lot of really leafy greens and a lot of fruits, mostly berries just because they're low, lower in sugar, but I eat a lot of berries. Um, I try to eat a lot of healthy fats in my diet. Um, I do I do eat mostly a plant-based diet, but I do eat meat sometimes. Sometimes I just really need a steak. So I can't call myself a vegetarian, but I do follow, mo and I don't really care to. I don't like that. I don't feel that I need, you know what I mean? My daughters are vegetarians, they're always pushing it on me. They're vegan actually. One daughter's vegan, one's a vegetarian. But um, I feel like we need to eat what makes us feel good, what makes you feel your healthiest. And a well-balanced diet, including some chocolate cake every now and then, because you know, life is not enjoyable if you're not also enjoying everything that life has to offer, which is sweet sometimes. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions or comments, please ask them down below in the comment section. I love interacting with you and I hope you found this helpful. I hope it didn't come off preachy. I never wanna come off that way because I know what's right for me isn't always right for you. So um, please just know my intentions are in the right place. And I hope you have a blessed and beautiful day. I'll see you next time.